Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of The Scrubbed In Show. I hope you've all been keeping well. This week we have with us another guest who probably doesn't need an introduction. We do have with us Liam, who is the interface between digital health systems, health tech. He's a health tech advisor, mentor, founder of Together Digital, and he's really on a mission to make the NHS, the healthcare ecosystem, ripe for innovation. I like to call him the Lego man. Because you have noticed with every piece of content, you know, there's always some reference to Lego in the nomad, you know, and very frank and honest opinion of the, the ecosystem landscape. Absolute pleasure having you on the show, Liam. How are you, buddy? Welcome to the show. I'm all right. Thank you. I'm all right. It's great. It's great to be hanging out with you guys. This is going to be a slightly different one. We usually kind of talk about career journeys, career paths, your motivations, your mission. You know, maybe we start with how you enter the world of healthcare digital health, the stuff you're doing now, and then we can kind of bring up speed because I know a lot of people would want to know, you know, health tech, how do you do well? What, you know, what do companies do wrong? All of those were the wonderful things, but you know, tell us your story. Yeah. Good place so to start. basically one night I was just asleep and I woke up in the middle of the night and I just felt like I had a calling for health and I was just like I woke up covered in sweat and I was like I've got to get into no that's not the story at all my <laughs> mate when I when I finished my computer science degree my mate um my mate Suki basically set, um, was working on a big NHS um IT rollout and he said to me like do you want a job and I couldn't think of anything else to do at the time um and so I went yeah and that basically landed me in the world of NHS which I think it was about 17 years ago that I fell into the NHS and I've always, over that time, had a series of roles that has been on the cusp of technology and changing stuff and healthcare. And uh, here, here we are today, really. This is the first time I'm hearing you had a comp sci degree. You mm. are, I see you as a creative, right? Like, yes. you know what we're doing. Like, you're a creative, right? Or maybe we're content creators and we're biased. How, how does that work? T tell me about yeah. that. So it's a good, good question, actually. So to be honest, I, like like most of us, like, you know, we, we like to go into the past and tell some fantastic story about how we ended up sort of going in something. But to be honest, I went to computer science because I couldn't think of anything else to do. Um, it turned out I was terrible at coding. I was terrible at all of the practical <laughs> stuff. But what actually happened is I had a couple of modules where um, I moved into the world of information and knowledge and systems thinking and actually like as someone who teaches systems thinking to the system itself now um there was a particular one where i learned soft systems methodology as it was kind of come through and i thought wow this is really interesting and exciting and then that kind of just you know um that led to me being in in the system itself really so yeah like um yeah Technology was different then, you know, you didn't go into technology because you were cool. You went to technology because you were not so cool, right? Oh, um, <laughs> and um, I'm just very lucky that technology has got more and more cool every year, right? So, yeah, it's great. It's, it's incredible, man. <laughs> and with, with, with the AI stuff that's happening, everyone's a superstar, yeah. right? Even if you can't barely write a line of code. Tell <laughs> us about kind of after graduating, you got brought into the system per se yeah. with your friend. What were you doing? What were the roles? What was the early phase of your career like? It's probably worth saying beforehand. Um, I've always had a bit of an authority problem. I've always struggled with authority. And I went to this national program and... Like as someone who doesn't really like authority, the worst place to go is a, is a huge IT system rollout in the, the biggest and most complex system in probably in the world. I don't know, one at least one yeah. of them. Um, and basically I, I had this weird situation where I just kept getting in trouble all the time, but I kept getting promoted at the same time. And it was very confusing, you know, cause like basically what I felt I was doing is like, you know, we were doing, we, so the electronic staff record program was basically the migration from a load of people running HR and payroll in Excel spreadsheets or mm. access databases and moving them into a system which was coordinated for the first time. A lot of the work that we did was really routine and boring to be honest, but I wanted to, I was like, okay, well, I want to do it this way because I think I can save a couple of days time and so on. They kept saying, just do it the way we tell you to. And I was like, but I don't want to do it that way. I want to do it way the better. Um, and then, so I carried on through that and I kept getting promoted up and kept getting promoted up. And then um, there was a lot of consultants on the team and I was like, you know, I was earning about 30 grand at the time. And I had these consultants that were only three times what I was earning. And then one of them said to me, Liam, you got a bit of sass you should just go and be a consultant because you know I earn three times what you do. And being me, I was just like, okay. So then I left, I went traveling and I came back, got on the phone 
and I called a recruitment consultancy and said, hi, my name's Liam and I'm a consultant. Can I have some consultancy work? And they went, <laughs> yeah, because it was a different world to nowadays where it's much more difficult, right? But they were yeah. just like, yeah, okay. And they came back and like, here's a, here's a menu. Where do you want to go and live? And I was like, <laughs> Cambridge, okay. Oh, wow. And, and that was the start of the next phase of my career, actually, where I started really getting into the NHS. So a lot of it was chance up until that point, really. And then a little bit of passion and interest really started coming in. You are like one of those nightmare people where like you're very good at your job, but you just don't respect authority. It's, it's a very interesting. Do you feel that has lended to why you are very successful now where you just go out and do things the way you think it should be done, not really have to answer to it? I know when you're a consultant, there are, mm. but what has lended itself to what you do so well now? It's interesting, right? So like my report card at school was disruptive, disruptive, disruptive. And my <laughs> parents didn't congratulate me for it. They didn't go, hey, you're a disruptor. That's really cool, Liam. You know, I generally got told off quite a bit. And like, particularly over the last couple of years, when I've been like working with senior leaders in the military and in the NHS around how to disrupt and like having people come on courses that I do around disruption, there's, there's a pervert, there's like a sort of, sort of perverse sort of completion mm -hmm. of the circle. The one thing that I've learned and actually that I teach quite a lot is, is that disruption isn't just one thing. And there's, there's, two, there's two definitions of disruption. The first one is chaos and anarchy and just fighting everything. And I think mm -hmm. actually as a young guy with a bit of a chip on my shoulder, I definitely was that guy for a while. But actually as I got older and started really learning the, the nuances and complexities of things, the thing that I suppose I realize is that disruption is, it has to be a, an empathetic and sophisticated art. So as a disruptor now, you know, okay, now and now and again, I might put out a bit of a punchy article that speaks a bit of truth to power and that, <laughs> that is my thing. But actually, I think disruption is about bringing people with you. It's about telling a different story. It's about curiosity. It's about inclusion. And, you know, because disruption is trying to change the system around us. And actually, you know, as I've come to really learn systems thinking, you know, people who just disrupt who are hotheads, um, there's, a, there's a system thinking rule that says the harder you push the system, the harder it pushes back. And mm. it's absolutely true. And so there's a lot of people who just try and take down the system as a disruptor and it doesn't work. Mm. And there was a lot of failure in my career where I really learned about the way to do it responsibly. A, a lot of our listeners will yep. be, will have picked up that you use the phrase systems thinking twice now, and they will be asking the question, mm. What exactly is that? So can you just walk us through systems thinking? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Well, um, I think it, I think it probably take about 18 hours for us to properly walk through systems <laughs> thinking. My, my last course was about 18 hours to kind of go through it. But in terms of systems thinking, I think, you know, even if you're a clinician in the system or, you know, you're, you're sort of on the periphery or a health tech company, like the, the, the healthcare system or any system is incredibly complex. There's lots of different mechanics and bolts and regulations and specific things. And realistically, if ever we're to make a system in, uh, sorry, to make a decision in the context of a system, there's two ways we can do it. We can do this like reductionist way of things where we basically push a button and, and, and hope that it goes okay. But actually in systems thinking that the mantra is that systems have a number of laws and that ultimately today's problems can often come from yesterday's solutions. And by that, what I mean is that reductionism means that we break things down we look at things in silos we don't look at the world around us like let's just look at discharge at the moment in the nhs mm. right a complex series of mechanics about people upstream downstream how they're treated where they're treated who's around and when we change one thing like the pension for nhs staff what mm. we see is that later on down the line we end up with a workforce crisis because people are leaving because there's less incentive. And so systems thinking is, is about trying to look at systems like this and, and make as the best possible decisions we can in a more holistic way rather than a, a reductionist way. And so I, I look at two domains when we're trying to get change. One is around sort of design thinking and trying to, you know, which I think is kind of in the mantra of what a lot of health tech companies do around innovation mm. and trying to look at the problem and the solution. But ultimately, if we just do that, often what we can do is it can bounce up the system and the system can just crush it because the system's the system because it's trying to change part of the system and it defends itself. So by looking at the two of them, that gives us an ability and a perspective to be able to plan for what might happen and to make sure that we don't inadvertently get negative consequences as a result. And so with a system as big as health and social care and integrating systems and so on, um, it's, a it's a really good practice to be able to do and it's really helped me think about the things that we do and what, what happens as a result. And I think it's great that you kind of call it a system because it is a system. It's not just an organization. It's mm. people's different bodies, different hierarchies. 
And mm. I think having that base knowledge and understanding is super important for some of the stuff we'll probably come down to talking later. Mm. You did a bit of traveling, you signed up to be a consultant, you're your own boss now. Tell yeah. us, you know, do you feel a bit more fulfilled in your career per se? You know, what were some of the early projects you got your teeth into? It's interesting um, because uh, I spent a lot of time in public health, a lot of time where information was starting to become a thing. And there was like, you mm. know, sort of regional directors who'd made a load of promises. And they were like, Liam, I wonder if you could tell me if uh, we've actually solved the problems. Like, well, have you been measuring it? And they're like, ah, ah, ah. Um, <laughs> and, you know, so, you know, generally it would be like, well, do you want, do you want me to try and find the answer you want? Or do you want me to actually find the truth? And they were like, I think so both, Liam. It depends yeah. what it says. And so I did a load of that. But actually in 2010, post-financial crash, um, the um, conservative Lib Dem coalition had just come in and was starting to bring about huge cost-saving efficiencies in the system, um, which at the time was called QUIP. Um, and, you know, if you say QUIP to some people who've been in the system for a while, they sort of shudder and shiver, yeah. you know. Um, and... Um, bizarrely they came up to me and sort of said hey Liam um we've got this senior um pharmacist um and we're basically looking to kick off a 90 million savings program for the for the sort of east of England region over a couple of years could you come and like you know be the PM set it up do the operational mm. stuff and I was like yeah okay pay my day right sounds interesting <laughs> <laughs> um, and actually, that ended up being the next eight years of my life because yeah. um, and this actually has sort of led me to be going from someone who was interested in a system to being really passionate about the system. Um, and so the, the short journey of what happened was um, and this, you know, was we instead of doing this like ivory tower thing where we just pointed at people and said, how are you performing and send us spreadsheets, which is still the general mantra for, you know, a lot of sort of regional bodies. We actually just went, how can we help? And so, you know, I could build websites, I could take computers apart, I couldn't put them back together again. But, you know, <laughs> like I had my degree in computer science, I was building stuff, I love data and so on. So what happened was we basically just built up this program that was hugely successful. And then we grew over the next couple of years. Uh, then the Lansley reform have happened. So we ended up becoming covering a quarter of the country. Um, and we were, the way that we treated it was like it was a collective investment program. And then over the following years, when the NHS all changed in Lansley reforms in 2013, we ended up landing with an academic health science network and being hosted by a hospital. And it was all very wild west. We weren't really owned by anyone. Mm. Um, and then we had a couple of years of just basically being this like intrasystem independent thing. But we were growing and growing and growing and our grief was getting bigger and the risk was getting bigger. And then we kind of had this point in 2000 and late 2015 where we were kind of asked to be taken over and owned or we had to spin out the system so we did, we then spun out of the yeah. um out of the NHS and built a, so, a, a social enterprise which um grew to cover all of the UK um using digital solutions getting together a community trying to reduce the time it takes for an innovative idea to actually get towards scale um producing pathways to change you know to, uh, to sort of change the hearts and minds of general practitioners and so on and by a general estimate, when we left, we'd helped the we'd helped the local commissioning bodies to save a couple of billion pounds, oh, wow. um, and NHS England were taking on national initiatives and so on. What I thought was really exciting at the time, and this is what really changed my mind about the system and really set me on my next course. Sorry, it's a big mind, but um, was um, we weren't like the NHS is very sort of you know everyone's got their place and this is your place and this is what you do and it's all kinds of silos and we basically just invented this grassroots community and we gave ownership and it was democratic and every commissioner got to vote on what we did and we had their voice in we basically gave back ownership to a group of medicines um, medicines optimization directors and leads there was a lot of stuff where we were literally disrupting the system because mm. it was these old things that took five years and they didn't really deliver much. And then people were like, well, we're going to disinvest and invest in this organization because they do more and they're quicker. Or NHS England would be doing something. And then we, they'd come to us, the commissioners would come to us and say, could you do it instead? Because you're quicker and we know you'll do it really well. And we said, yes. And then we got to, we were told like, don't do it. We're telling you not to. And we're like, well, we don't work for you. So what we'll do is mm. we'll take tell us give us your rationale and we'll send it to commissioners and if they vote by the majority they don't want us to do it then we'll stop doing it and so we became this like new power mechanism in the nhs and that for me was the thing that i found really exciting we were using digital to get this group of people across the whole country to work together and vote together collectively and that made me really think you know before i left like i want to take this further i want to see how can we actually stop being so slow and like just grinding everything down for ourselves and start finding new ways where we can collectively produce grassroots movements. <laughs> um, and so that's what I do nowadays. Like that's one of, one of the parts of my role of what I do. And so I'm really interested in 
power and changing dynamics and how digital can play a role and how we can actually change our environment so digital can work better. And so that's when the passion really started coming. And it was a wild, crazy ride, um, you know, doing that. And I'm really proud of that piece of work. But, you know, now I'm out there trying to see if I can build a build a bigger thing for the system and try and do it in different places. With the with systems thinking now and talking about getting innovations out mm -hmm. there, right? right? The question I want to ask is, and this is what everyone mm -hmm. will say about the NHS, is that innovations are just so difficult to get out there. And some people will say, well, it's because it's a massive body. Or it's because, oh, it's just because there's too many layers in the organization. Some people will say, well, it's patient safety reasons because you can't really roll out any innovations quickly. It's, it takes 10, 15 years to do anything. I'd love your opinion mm. now. Why does innovation, or does it, does it actually take very long to get an innovation out there? What's your opinion on that? Um, it takes a long time to get stuff out there. Like there's the system, there's problems on both sides. If we're entirely honest, um, and this like, you know, I wouldn't necessarily attribute this to when, for example, good clinicians come from the system and build something and they really get the area and, you know, mm -hmm. like they, 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 they continue this journey and navigate the system in the right kind of way. You can always tell those kinds of organizations, but there's a lot of people who've had nothing to do with healthcare. They've never been in the system. And what they're doing is they're saying, we're gonna build something and we're gonna transform this part of the system. And I think, you know, it's kind of fueled by the sort of disruptor mentality, but what we're talking about, as you guys know, right, is complex humans, complex interactions and complex systems. And I think a lot of health tech organizations really like, bring a degree of naivety and arrogance that's supported by mm. naive, naivety and arrogance in their vest investors. And they think, yeah, we can just come and we'll just do it across all these people and do all of this mm. kind of stuff. Like a lot of the time I sit with companies and I'm just talking through and like the most important thing about getting like, you know, you've got to understand your patient. You've got to understand the service. You've got to understand the people who are going to pay for you who genuinely want the service. The vast majority of organizations maybe have understood the service user outside of the context of a care service. But many don't even understand the service that they're looking to put it into or to shift mm. across or redesign pathways across. The different actors that surround the service and they don't understand the system. And I think that's a real problem. If health tech companies want to survive in what's a very difficult environment, they can over time. This like, how can we get commissioned in 12 months is rubbish, it doesn't exist. No, no one does <laughs> ever, unless there's a pandemic. And let's hope there's not yeah. another one because yeah. you know I think we're, we're done with that. Yeah. So. Like the only thing that I can say, and I say to companies, and this tends to be what I do with them, is you've got to really understand the system. You've got to understand what the current state is, who the players are, who the influencers and stakeholders and all of these different things. And you've got to really understand these nuances because if you miss one of them, then there yeah. might be some powerful person who just pulls it all down or drags it down. And this is mm -hmm. where I suppose we go to the NHS. Like when we talk about health tech, we are talking about disruption. We're talking about taking part of the system and changing it. Systems don't like to be changed. They're there to hold themselves up. And so from a systems thinking perspective, what people are saying is we're going to come in, we're just going to push really hard and we're going to get someone to put it in and it's all going to change and it's all going to be great. But in the system, suddenly there's reservations, there's views about risk, there's mm. concerns around things. There's a lot of people who maybe don't understand it or that it's possible. You've got incredibly long governance processes like um, in 2021, I built like a 12 month course for people in the system to mm. understand all of the ways that they slow themselves down and crush innovation and how to do it differently. And so from this perspective, you know, like from both sides of this, like the system is slow and cumbersome and you've got to understand it to hack it. Like the way that we succeeded in the NHS when we really started to succeed and continue to succeed was when we really started to see where we could find that ground in between. We weren't pushing mm. it too hard. We weren't pushing hard enough, but we could see the NHS has lots of different loopholes and ways you can hack it. That's how you win in the system. But that requires knowledge and understanding and sophistication. And so the more you understand it, the more you can anticipate how the system is going to grind you down and then counter mm. it. And I think a lot of the stuff that I've been putting out recently over the last couple of weeks actually has been like, how do you counter certain aspects? Like if governance is just gonna be a total dog's dinner, how can you influence it as best possible so you don't just inadvertently get crushed or it doesn't just sit there going bouncing from thing to thing to thing. So I don't necessarily use systems thinking as much in health tech companies. I tend to use it on working with NHS and Health Foundation, yeah. stuff like that when I'm mm. advising the health system. It does play a role. And you've got to be able to think about the system in both cases, you know, and you can't expect the system will just understand itself and be able to make that happen. So 
yeah, until organizations have that level of sophistication and leaders really spend the time and energy to understand the system, the services, the service users, those who interact with it. Yeah, we're just they're going to keep on bouncing off the wall, like smashing onto it like an egg and sliding down. And then we'll quietly not say anything because no one wants to talk about health tech companies that go under. Mm. No knowledge will be passed on. The next round will turn up, smash against the wall. Yeah. And, you know, the, the, the cycle will repeat. Um, but good companies do grow and go through. And all of the seasoned leaders, they mm. know it's a long game. They know it's a marathon, you know? Mm. I was going to say, is there an example of a company that you've seen that has navigated this NHS system landscape really well and, you know, examples of where they completely messed it up. Well, so, the, you know, there are some companies who have realized that some of the things that they're trying to bring are a little bit too much. And what they've done is they've met the system in terms of what their immediate gains and transformation is so they can build in. So a lot of organizations that are trying to build up to AI have mm -hmm. quite sensibly started looking at functional improvements that mean data is gathered and then can start to build that over time. And there's a few good examples of that. There's a very well-known example of a particular company in primary care who had a really good way of getting traction across general practice where it's a real graft, you know, getting to each, each mm. general practice is really hard. And they had a really good way of being able to basically use endorsement from place to place to place and to incentivize it, which has meant that they integrated enough to then be able to, you know, insert products into that particular area. And, you know, they've been well, well acclaimed for doing so. There's, there's lots of different, you know, there's lots of different examples. Like a lot of the obvious examples that people talk about or used to talk about like Babylon and so on are generally like yeah. loophole companies where generally they've realized there's a loophole and they've managed to get in to do something but you know many of those haven't necessarily succeeded so well as well maybe another question which i'm sure a lot of this will be interested in hearing is how do you then get the traction you need for the system to be more receptive to the innovation or the disruption what can mm. you do the way i talk about it is like proactivity now you can't have everything that the system needs right mm. but a company that is understanding their area and constantly listening and really hearing what they need will hopefully be able to hear the things that they are being told that are required by the system. So what I talk about is kind of like bootstrapping, emerging, and then established, right? Yeah. And that all of these areas, there's different levels of proactivity. So the first thing about proactivity is just try to create articles that suggest things that could be used in business cases and tenders and you know like you know obviously they've got to go through their detax and stuff like that but basically anything where there's an internal process being able to try and provide content and information to support people writing it will increase their chances of success then we go around the cycle again but ultimately what happens is when nhs organizations use it what they can then do is start using those as templates to go, ah, oh, you know, this trust down the road. Well, they just use this for their decision making process and you can start to do that. Then mm. as you start to get towards more success, you so, you know, you're building up effectively a playbook approach, like a bootstrapped playbook to, to kind of increase this, because ideally things scale in the NHS. And the way that yeah. my organization scaled is we got to a tipping point where absolutely where ultimately, you know, we were we were growing because other people were saying, oh, yeah, we use them and we invest in them. And then it got to a point where half of the country was, and then we just slid down that scale and completed mm. coverage. Mm. And behind that journey was us basically writing the business cases, giving all the information that they need, every single thing that they needed. Whenever a big CSU came together and tendered, we would just give them everything they needed for a tender. Mm -hmm. Or we'd go, oh, actually, here's a couple of other example tenders that, that we used in order to commission us. So they just used that one from down the road. And you know, increasingly, what we're doing is you're just building up a really good playbook. Not necessarily mm. just for being purchased and implementation, but then also being maximized in terms of innovation. And I think the final point around this is the NHS is really bad at using mm. technology and software to its full effect. They'll use yeah. it for basic stuff, but they won't take it further. It's, it's knowing a... the system and trying to basically slowly bring it along until you're evidenced as a player and going around in the cycle from bootstrap to merging and just every single cycle, just creating more and more content. So over a three year cycle, you could really see yourself starting to have something quite sophisticated as you went through those annual periods. Mm. And I think it's good. And I think, you know, you're just, you know, the tip of the iceberg. And I think it introduces the conversation and a different way of approaching the system. The two mm. questions I had, and you kind of alluded to is, who are the right people to speak to when it comes to bringing your innovation or your tech or whatever it is into the system? What I realized is, you need buying from the top and the bottom and people are very mm. good at one or the other, never both. Mm -hmm. And tell us a bit more about this life cycle, 
sales cycle, purchase cycle, because, you know, you think you can and it's just buy things whenever, any time of the year, but obviously there's more to it. So those are the two things I'm quite interested to know more about. It's re- I, I think it's really important to find your problem owners, right? And mm. I've written quite a lot of stuff around, like really focusing on the problems you solved and where they exist in the context of the NHS is really, really important because ultimately that resonates with people who really live that problem. They, there is no other champion in the system than those people who are frustrated by the thing that you solve. And if mm. you can put that across, that's really, really important. There is no finance director or CIO or anyone who champions it like they do, right? So that's the first kind of thing, right? And trying to support them in that way is really, really important. Using them for advocacy and trying to support them to be able to put the case across. So trying to put across, help them with the financial case or some business case content and stuff like that, you know, that can be really good will help them to be able to do that. So generally what I say is like, all right, every time I've got a client who's got a meeting, it's a big meeting and they've got this clinical champion, the clinical champion really wants to take them forward. And they're like, oh my God, like you totally define the problem. We really want to solve it. You, we can see that you're doing this stuff in this area. They're then required to go and navigate the matrix right of governance and stuff like that so being able to support them and build up champions in that way because the finance director will go how much does it cost how much will we get back where's the evidence you know you'll get the data protection people who go and want to know all about data security so trying to think about the personas like Mm. what i always suggest is all right who are the key personas so it's going to be it the program management team it's going to be maybe a cio or someone like that who's probably going to be the ultimate ultimate champion at board level and trying to basically start to kind of use those and say look what we want to do is we don't, you, you know, we want to help you. Can we get a meeting with these key individuals where you bring them in and we'll have conversations around different areas? Prepare for those personas, actively get them in the room and try and win them when you can. Have conversations with them because if they go into that governance meeting, there's two situations. Situation one is person goes, yeah, I saw this paper. What's this all about? I didn't know anything about this. And they'll try and kill it, right? Because that's right. what happens in the service. But if they've been in that meeting and you've listened to them and said, yeah, here's all the stuff we've done for data security. A lot of people make assumptions. Being able to use this to be able to kind of get in, you know, get in. So everybody who's in the room that you try and get all of the detractors, work out who they are and then be able to address those issues. So it's there is no debate at the point when governance happened. They're all just like, yeah, we all agree. It's a really good idea. And I think doing that when you know someone's going to a closed room that you can't be in, you can't answer the questions Mm. is is crucially important. Making sure that you're doing that around the, in the calendar year cycles means that as you're coming up to the October, November crunch point, you're preparing them in the right time scales for that. Like it's, it's a complex dance. The other thing that I'll say is it changes from time to time. If you're going to an ICB, if you're going to a trust, if you're going to a general practice, if you're going to a community pharmacy or a community health provider, it will be different in every single one of these organizations because they are not that they do not function in the same way. They're not paid in the same way. They don't have the same priorities and so on. As I've tried to give you a sort of general view of yeah. how I, I would proactively seek to do it. But actually beyond this, it depends on the environment as well. And they will all have differences in different ways, mm. you know? No, incredible. And it, I like what you said in terms of equipping those champions with the material or the insight for the barriers they will come and face very soon right mm. i can imagine a lot of companies probably just be like you're a champion now it's up to you to go and kind of get the board convinced and whatever right and that might be the first time mm. they're trying to push some sort of innovation the yeah. second question because i know you're in the sex in the intersection between the systems and the, and the founders and stuff like that mm. what do you think the system can do to be more receptive to it or you know how do we get them to be more receptive? because i know the founders are probably going to be like you know I wish yeah. just, you know, rapidly innovate and stuff like that. Is is it just the nature of the game? Is it, it's, this is just the way it's going to be for a while? Mm. Um, or is there anything that, you so know, I don't know. There's, there's, well, there's quite a lot. So um, the problem with the system is it's a system for the wrong age. We now live in a hyper-connected network world, right? We live in a world where complexity means that we have to be solving things closer to where the problem exists, right? And often we can still get this top-down iceberg of ignorance, you know, this newtonian view of the world if we break everything down into its components parts we can manage it effectively and Mm. that is failing everywhere so at the top level the system needs this we need a new vision for a system i'm not seeing it yet in labor's plans it's definitely not in the existing administration's plans so like the bigger problem is is that we have to really think about how we start building connected agile systems not just the crap version of agile we have in the system but genuinely agile where we think about things happening at at the proximity to value because risk is not that. We need to get like as a system and actually so like 
accelerators, right? We have all of these accelerators. Yeah. And when you've got an accelerator, what you do is you get all the companies now and they do their parade. And they, yeah, here they are. Here's a solution. It's shiny. And you get people who are system leads and they go shiny like this yeah. and they get really excited about. But the problem with this is they then carry the shiny thing. They don't live in that context. They don't understand the problem there, right? And as long as we've got everyone doing the shiny parade, we've got a real problem. Yeah. The problem that we should be, the, the, the thing that we should be really focusing on is understanding and generating problem mentalities. What are the problems people have? You know, so a lot of companies um, in the NHS come to me and they say, Liam, we really want to generate more ideas and people put forward more solutions. And I say, what are you doing to understand the problems? And they go, well, no, we want solutions and ideas. I'm like, yeah, but if people don't know how technology can solve a problem, don't we want to find who's got the problems and, and create a safe environment to help them navigate it? It's really weird talking about health tech and my system stuff in one go. I've got, I, feel yeah, like, yeah. I feel like I've got multiple personality disorder. In this <laughs> cool. um, I, I feel like there's a big wall and like never the two shall meet, right? But so I think we need a system that really owns and understands problems that we try and devolve, you know, so accelerators that are problem focused accelerators and not just the nationally defined problems, but where a clinician could come along and say, I run a neuro disability service and we need to be able to see this and manage these people in this way. And these are their accessibility needs. And these are the things that they have. And we've been asked to improve our performance, but we don't know how to do it. And I could repeat this on like 50 different services, right? The same kind of, and it's, it will be different from one to one to one for them to be able to come and do this will help them to be understood so they can get the right kind of partners. They can become the right kind of champions. So I think devolution like silly power mechanics that we've got in this old power yeah. system hiding information like i built a crm for a few organizations where i've mapped all of the different like the icb structures the sub icb structures the general practices what it systems they have in primary and secondary care it took me days and days and days because that information is all made difficult and hidden like mm. there's a whole number of sort of system elements where we've got to move towards transparency better networks problem orientation not shiny thing you know so there's a lot that the system needs to do. It's not, there's no quick fix for it, to be honest. You know, getting dealing with governance is another one because it just, it's awful. Liam, so for health tech founders, right? They've, they're sitting there, they listen to you mm -hmm. and they've got a light bulb moment for an idea, right? I feel like when you're working, yeah. when you're looking to work with, the, with a system like the NHS, it's not just problem, your solution, build the MVP, test it. I feel like there's a lot more mm -hmm. questions to ask. Give us some critical questions that, the founder who's listening to you right now has to answer on paper, map it out before they just dive deep into sort of building this innovation out. Firstly, obviously, who is the service user? What's their pains and gains? What do they need? What are their, what can they do? What can't they do? Like we've got to start with the user, right? Yep. And a lot of people do that well. The next thing is in the system, who is the service that serves them or services? Because if we think about MSK, you know, mm. you've got your first contact practitioners who then go to a, um, a first, um, and any qualified provider in the community that will then go to a specialist service as they go. So trying to think about, all right, where do they go at specific points? Um, mm. it, it is, is really critical. So you can understand the services, trying to find a way to just understand who represents those, those, those services or those professions, you know, if you're in speech and language therapy, go and understand how speech and language therapy works and how that, you know, that side of things works. Um, beyond that, then I think it's where are they situated? What are the kinds of organizations, how are those organizations commissioned and for what are they organizations who are a, or you can eat diner on a block contract where they're just paid to just serve as many patients as possible. Are mm. they, are they general practitioners who have very specific targets and metrics, but aren't like, aren't paid to invest in care. Um, mm. it, you know, cause ultimately you've got to know who your customer is and where the transformation is kind of happening. Similar, if you want. If, if you start to come to the conclusion or think that, you know, the, the, the organization might be, how do I put this? Um, you can't start coming to the conclusion that you're going to be changing a pathway or redesign a service or that something is going to materially have to change. Then you also need to know if it went from one place to another, or you're empowering one kind of staff, how are they paid? What's the frameworks? You know, a lot of companies are like, okay, well, we can put it. GPs can do this, so acute centres don't, or community mm. pharmacists. But actually, what does a community pharmacy contractual framework say? Yeah. What are they paid for and not paid for? How is that incentivized? Trying to understand that. And then I think the final thing that, like, there's, there's probably a million things, but the final thing in a short, you know, format that we've got here <laughs> is, like, just 
I suppose, trying to understand where the system objectives align with it. What does the long-term plan say about it? Is it a priority or not a priority? Is there something adjacent to that that is or isn't a priority? Like, are they in the operational planning guidance? Um, does it feature in what good looks like, you know, the, the tech thing? And who in this context is being considered as the most important part of the system? So if you do a communication platform, there's no point going to provider now because what good looks like, for example, says that the local integrated care systems or ICBs should be creating common communication platforms. So there's the policy side of it as well. And then mm. out of this should hopefully emerge either oh my God, and then you run away or the alternative, which is, all right, I can start to see what happens. And to be honest, like this tends to be like the thing that I'd say is, and I'm, like, I'm not plugging here, but mm -hmm. if you're new to a system and you don't or you've just been in one part and you're trying to solve something, get help from people who understand the system, yeah. who can sit there and do it. Because sometimes I sit down with companies, I'm like, all right, so this is how these are paying these. So actually you think you're sending to these ones, but actually they're not going to pay you for this. It's community, it's community health services. Community health services will do this, but they will need to be, they will need to put the pitch up to integrated care boards because this is a, this is a care outcome and it's an upstream thing. You know, so you start getting to that and suddenly it's like, all right, this then starts to talk about viability. And I think this is where it goes. Yes, service user. Yes, the transformation. Yes, introducing the technology. But ultimately, you have to understand the system because it could be that you come up with all the great answers, which is perfect for a service, but nobody's going to pay for it. In which case, yeah. what are you doing? You know, there's a lot of companies. There's a lot of companies <laughs> who I talk to in the early stage and they go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't worry, we'll work it out. And I speak, I see them at, see them at some show a couple of years later and they're like, <laughs> no one wants to buy us. And I'm kind of like, yeah, um, yeah, it's funny that, you know. Off of the back of that, right? What's the one thing that most people are just so oblivious to? Like, what's the one thing that they'll go, nah, that, that doesn't matter. Is there a certain department, a certain uh, category? What would you say is the one thing that everyone is just blindsided by and then they hit a brick wall? Do you mean, do you mean things strategically as a health tech company that they just don't do? Or do you mean areas of care? Because I can give an answer uh, to both if you want. Like nobody understands community health services. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll answer that one. Like <laughs> no, literally nobody in the world, even lots of people in just England have no idea what community yeah. health services do. And they're super yeah. important. They are the future of care. And everyone's mm. like, oh, primary, primary, acute, acute. And acute's obviously important. But community health services yeah. are the game changing feature, right? And I like, I've written an article about them. I advised NHS England around digitizing yeah. the sector. And, you know, like I've worked with these organizations, love the hell out of them. And they are really good for health tech companies. Plug in for community here. Um, <laughs> they're really good for health tech companies because actually they tend to be containable and repeatable and paid for specific things. So they're actually really attractive areas and people just overlook. So that's me answering the question that you probably didn't ask. <laughs> now now um, to the strategic the one that <laughs> everyone wants to listen to, listen in on. Who, who pays and what's their what's their requirement to like what is the what is the model for payment mm -hmm. like and i think a lot of companies just assume if they can create value then the system will pay for it but like mm -hmm. i work with a company that built this like really nice attractive um remote monitoring solution for people in health and social care like basically they went to the social care system and social care was like, yeah, we're not paying for health stuff. And they went to the healthcare system and they were like, yeah, but do you have all of these different things? Like, yeah, but this, but this is, but this is built around my nan, you know, my, my granny mm, and she had this yeah, experience. Yeah. So I'm building it so she can have a better experience. And they're like, we don't pay for that. And they, yeah. they basically they had to go and redesign much of their product because they had two silos who had different objectives and didn't want to pay for it. And I see in here this time and time and time again, you know? Mm. Um, so that's probably one of the, like, and it's not a small thing who, is your i'm not going to say payer i never say payer but yeah who, who is your who is your commissioner who's the person who's actually going to pay for it what are they required to what's their priorities and yeah. how are they going to pay for it like a lot, a yeah. lot of companies are pitching products and they still haven't got the answer to that question i can see how this becomes very interesting and like a good place to build and innovate within i want to throw something in the mix which makes things even more complicated it's the introduction of outside money vcs investors <laughs> Right. So not that it's not hard enough, right? Not that it's not hard enough. So after COVID, the amount of money that was put into health tech is, is beyond belief, right? It seems any other day someone's raising a, a, a shit ton of money. Tell us your thoughts on that. I just realized what? we get to swear on your podcast now. That's cool. Um, <laughs> that's been really, that's been really nice. Okay. Um, well, Abdul, I feel you're setting me up here because you know my, because you've seen my article about VCs and you know that I've got some thoughts about VCs. Yes. Um, well, one, no, like there's a lot of VCs who've ran away from the UK <laughs> health tech, which is interesting. 
Um, mm. And like, I was ended up with an online debate with someone in the US who's like, "Oh, all these UK companies are coming saying we're going to win the I was NHS." To say, it's yeah. like, it's like, well, actually, every investor they're going to says, "Oh no, you also like you have to win the US as well." Exactly. Um, I think there's a huge like, okay, 2021. Yeah, everyone's going, we're going through a digital revolution in health and everything's going to be different in two years. And, you know, it's like Disneyland. Mm. Um, and all the investors were like, yeah, yeah, 50 million. You're worth yeah. 100 million. And you're... <laughs> I, I was looking at this and I was talking to some of my more mature friends and we we're like, wow, this is a bubble. They, these guys are going to get some terrible. And so ult like, ultimately, without being rude, read my article if you want to hear my real voice, my real yeah. thoughts about it. But... Again, I, it's the same kind of thing that fuels the health tech companies. It's kind of like there's a degree of naivety and arrogance mm. that they think they can chuck a load of money and they're going to disrupt yeah. a system, which is one of the most complex systems that you mm. can get in any, in any country or globe. You know, one particular example is they invest in something and they're like, sell, 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 sell all year round. What we're going to do is we're going to throw all this and here's your targets and you've got a, yeah. you've got a 5X in 12 months. No one 5Xs in 12 months in the NHS ever. <laughs> You know, and they set all of these targets and then the founders agree to all of these different things because they need the money. And yeah. there is a cycle between this where, you know, where there's a lot of competition for investors. They make loads of promises that they probably can't fulfill. The investors come in and go, and I've been sat there with health tech companies. And I won't say who, but like I've been sat there with health tech companies where they're in like, yeah, we kind of promised that. But like, you know, we'll let, we'll, we'll, we'll give them we'll give them the reality slightly later. Right. Like then they go, all right, well, here's your sales targets. And we're going to drip feed your money based on your performance against this. And you've got to put all your all, all your time and energy into sales team. They get all these BD people, generally BD people who don't understand the system whatsoever. And it's just yeah. like, yeah, they've just come from, I don't know, they've just come from selling cakes or something. I don't know. And then, you know, it's like, yeah, I'm just going to sell to the healthcare system. Um, and then that they come in and it doesn't work. It doesn't work because the system is a complex mechanism and it buys at certain times and it has cycles and, you know, and then they're not hitting their targets. And then suddenly you get what you're getting in a lot of health tech companies companies at the moment where they just pull the plug suddenly all the sales folks go or they get rid of their product team or something which is ridiculous and suddenly they just basically become a zombie of a company mm. and you know all the good people leave and then the company dies and mm. i think you know i don't want to just say it's vc that are responsible for this but i've talked to a lot of vc companies and a lot of them have no idea and i don't know mm. if it was my money like I don't invest in health tech com invest health tech companies because I don't have any money. But if I did have money, <laughs> I wouldn't be investing in health tech companies because, like, and I know the system and I could probably help them be more successful. But like, you know, v VCs, it's it's not the ideal thing, but it is the thing that we've got right. And you know, like, to be honest, I'd like to see something more like DARPA in the US and kind of borrow from sort of sort of Mariana Mazzucato's kind of approach of like you know the entrepreneurial state and so on. And get more sustainable money where where there is a co-investment from the system and we're sharing responsibility because i think a lot mm. more would happen but we're in a vc mm. world right it's nothing there's nothing more we can do and there are some good ones there are some yeah. good ones i do so like the, the, the idea of co-investing trust building co-developing startups spin-ups the question that it all comes down to is mm. it then possible to build a sustainable profitable business with the nhs or my fear is people hear this stuff and they're like, hey, do you know what? Sod the NHS. I don't want to innovate in it. It's so difficult. I'm going to go to the US or Middle East or, you know, all of these countries where I'm paying, you know, so it's so again, a shit ton of money again, right? Can you actually build a profitable business in the NHS or this, with the system? So, so like, you know, folks like Gus Kennedy and so on talk about some of the yeah. challenges in the system where he talks about how, you know, it gets lowered and they basically force companies to become unprofitable. And there's a lot, yeah. there's a lot of true truisms in what he says. I built something that's still going and it was multi-million pound turnover a year. Um, it is possible mm. to do something. Yes, we weren't an app. We were, we did things different, you know, we used it in different ways, but like it is possible, but it takes a lot of time. Um, and I think the key thing at the moment is we have a highly saturated market, right? Mm -hmm. Now, each system can only really accommodate so much innovation and right now. And actually, you know, like this is where I have a huge amount of sympathies for like, you know, the HSNs and the NIA who've got every company going, yeah, you're going to make us successful. And the next one comes again, yeah, you're going to make us successful. And the next one comes again, you're going to, and they're just kind of like, how many of these do we have to put through the tunnel, you know? Yeah. Um, like, and so, you know, after COVID globally, everybody thought that now was the time and everything was changing. And we probably did need that bubble to burst and for it to get to a small and more manageable level. I think we will have a swing in the system where the system realizes that it needs to 
needs to put a bit more in. I think realistic mm. system kind of treats you like you're really just lucky to be talking to the NHS, you know, even though your company's not profitable and stuff like that. And actually, I think sometimes there is a bit of a system arrogance that doesn't recognize we as a system absolutely need to value these providers because we haven't got any workforce coming. So we may as well, like, you know, what's the other thing? It's got to be digital solutions, right? So mm. I think a little bit, you know, and actually I think as things get worse, which they will, um, cause none of the systems thinking, none of the material parts of the system are changing and the demand is going up. So obviously they will, it is possible, but it's not possible for every business to be profitable. And, you know, I think that's, that's the key, that that's the key thing at the moment. Um, but I think you've got to get money that allows you to go for the longer term, like the companies that are the best that manage to actually build up are the ones who don't go for huge valuations and investment. They try to get by it whilst they're building it up with a smaller team. It's not, mm -hmm. you know, they're not, they're not, they don't have this 10 X mentality. They're just like, all right, mm -hmm. it's going to take a while for us to build it up, you know, and, and if we're fi financially prepared to kind of for that to happen in inches, like, you know, like when I talk through the story of what we managed to build, it's like, oh, it's really good. It took us eight years. It took us eight yeah. years from the very first concept to, to, to getting towards total national coverage. And I think there's a lot of companies that are like, we don't have a tolerance for eight years. Exactly. You know? mm. eight Especially years. VCs, right? VCs in the mix. I've exited my third company <laughs> in eight years. What are you talking about? You know, it's yeah. just like, so. Um, Liam, at this point, I'm just thinking now how you develop your company. Would something like, something similar to how venture studios run work quite well with the NHS? What do you, what do you think of that? As in, it's all essentially brought in-house, yeah. fueled by the, the NHS. Um, co-developed and run like a business, not run like a like an in-house project. What, what do you think of that? So I'm, I'm glad you asked because actually last year I spent a lot of the year with the Health Foundation building something that emulates that. So mm. um, what we were looking at is, and so I, um, with a fab organization called Public, um, we were supporting the Health Foundation to do the research and I spent a lot of time leading the thinking around the research around relational care concepts and proactive care and how we can start to build the next horizon of care and doing lots of interviews. And then working very closely with the um, health foundation team we supported them to be able to design something that actually moves away from the health foundation thing to something that is more like more like a sort of social or social or sort of value-based venture capital system mm -hmm. now the health foundation is not venture it's a charity but what mm -hmm. we try to do is take some of the best of you know those particular things and actually that program applications finish in nine days and we're going to start mm -hmm. to see something that is supported and nurtured and then there are different steps of investment and so i'm not currently involved in it but i'm close to the folks who are doing it and i'm really really excited to see how that's going to happen because as you said like I think something like that is really interesting and yeah. offers value. And actually, I think if we can build something like this properly, and maybe that it's more locally connected. And so actually, you know, as the health innovation networks, you know, the, the, the new version comes through, what I'd love to see is something that was kind of much more system owned and grassroots, but was kind of almost like sandboxing the ability to do innovations, but also the ability to kind of maybe in, invest in a slightly different mm. way, you know, that, that kind of co-ownership in and actually like if you read the recent um i oh, was it imperial or uclp the, um uh, lord darcy and o'shaughnessy's paper uh, they did it was imperial right talking about equity in the system i think you know we're yeah. starting to kind of bring that concept in as well so i really think there is a possibility to have something that resembles more of a spinning in and what's interesting is i think it might end up landing on labor's desk and it's like yeah. it's really weird you know we've got we our, our policies sometimes seem to be like totally <laughs> totally mixed you never would have thought they would do that but i think we might start seeing something like that out of necessity yeah and i think it will be similar to how universities do it mm. right where they kind of get kind of buy in equity they give the resources to kind of go spin this out obviously there's a bit of flack in terms of they take the lion's share which is probably changing the Final question is, I imagine doing the work you are doing, it gets incredibly frustrating at times. How do you keep going? How do you relax? How do you enjoy yourself? But what, what keeps you motivated? You know, because you're turning up day in, day out and you're not doing something that's super easy, right? You're not in fintech or insure tech or ad tech where it's just like silly money thrown around, you know, people get it. How do you look yeah. after yourself and stay motivated? Motivation's never been a problem, really. Like, the, the, you know, the thing is, I, when I left my organization, I, I sat there and I had a blank piece of paper and I was like, what's the thing I give a shit about most in the world that I want to do? Like, 
what's the what's the biggest impact I could have in my life? And it's not being a millionaire. I'm not, you know, I don't, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna earn any money doing what mm. I do. But like, what I want to do is at the right time, I want to be able to really help us to build the right kind of system. And I think mm. at this moment in time, you know, particularly as we're starting to talk about the advent of AI and who controls it and is it in our interests or, you know, and reading things like, you know, Yuval Noah Harari's like Homo sapiens yeah. and whether Homo Deus behind me, um, is like, I feel that we have a choice and we like, you know, each, each age has its own associated philosophies. And I yeah. think we either find a way to build systems where we compete by creativity and empowerment and like, you know, giving people agency and helping them to be able to, and so, you know, to be able to flourish in this new world, or we use technology to impose huge amounts of control, like we're seeing in China. And I think this plays out in every mm. part of society. So, you know, I don't know how I'm going to get there. And I'm sure it's just going to be like, you know, I'm going to bounce off walls like everybody else. And it's going to be full of frustration. But I know what my mission is. And I want to help try and make that happen. I may fail. I, I may play no part in it because I'm in the wrong place at the wrong time. I don't know. But I, I want to be part of that story. And I want us to create an empowered system. And that really motivates me. I really mm. care about it. And like, I actually, I, this is a societal thing to me more than health and social care. I really care about health and social care because I think it's important. And I think what it stands for is incredibly important, right? You know, for humanity and for how we run our society. So that really motivates me. Um, like, I'm going to be honest, like, I, I'm on a multi year cycle of like burnout and chill out and, you know, recover and burn out and chill out and recover. And, you know, like, to, end of 2021, I was totally burnt out from trying to do this thing too much. So I, I'm not going to pretend I've got some amazing recipe. I'm just like, I'm just, I'm, I, I'm, I'm like that to be honest, but like, you know, I've got, I've got a partner and a wonderful son and, you know, I enjoy spending time with them and I'm going down to three days a week over the holidays so I can teach my son to swim and go camping oh, nice. over the weekends. And, amazing. You know, like I, as I get older and grayer, I'm trying, I'm, I'm trying to find a way to answer that question, but I'm not entirely sure I've got the answer just yet. Yeah, we we always like to ask that question. Yeah. Maybe just trigger some thought for some founders and advisors and mentors because they're so relentless and focused on their mission and impact. They kind of tend to forget about themselves, right? Yeah, so we're all burning nice out. All of us, right? right? right. <laughs> How do you do it? They go, oh, I, I do, I, I do meditation, and then they go and they go, oh my god, I'm so burnt out, right? And, you know, <laughs> and the most real thing I, I recently read is there is no such thing as work life balance. It's just. BS, right? Like if you're really going to do something, if you're going to really build something or a platform or make a real genuine change, there is no work-life balance for a very, very long time. It's just they like to preach it. But in reality, they do not have work-life balance. So, if Every <laughs> single health tech founder I know, right? Like I go, I, you know, I send them a text at like eight in the evening and I've had my dinner and spent a couple of hours with my son and so on, you know, and so on. And I've got an okay work-life balance because I'm not, I'm not running a startup, but I text them and I'm like, oh, what are you up to? And they're like, oh, I'm just finishing this, this investor pitch deck. And I'm just like, oh man, <laughs> I would want to do that. So yeah. Um, so yeah, I think it's very hard to have that work-life balance, you know, but actually okay. having a child six and a half years ago has made me start to like, Slow down. I'm not achieving the impact that maybe I'd want to achieve at this stage in my life. But mm. I'm being the father that I want my child to have, or most of the time. So that's the most important thing at this time. True. And then, you know, I can scale it up as he gets a bit older. So, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I think you're a very sensible individual. This was a whirlwind of a conversation. I'm sure a lot of things have probably thrown over a lot of people's head, including ours yeah. at times. But I think <laughs> the main thing for us is we, you can imagine the type of guests we usually get, right? Founders, entrepreneurs, like, and I thought it'd be nice to kind of get someone that's very different, that makes you think, opens up conversations, and you have a lot of good stuff, a lot of good content you're putting out. Obviously, you work closely with a lot of companies. Um, I think we, you're right. We do need to think about the ways we approach it. And I think the systems-led approach is, is the way to go, for sure. Mm. Absolutely. Well, it's been an absolute no. pleasure hanging with you guys for the last hour, hour or so. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. No, Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.